it's time to return to the Spark Station 5. I'm going to try to get an optical drive installed in it, try to get an operating system installed on it, and see if I can get it configured into my network and maybe get some software on it and try to actually use the thing a little bit. Probably I'm not going to try to do very much more than that. Um, I think that will that will strain my patience about as thin as possible. Uh, but we'll see. So let's actually start by replacing that NVRAM chip and then get the optical drive in it and just, just keep soldiering away after that. So let's go ahead and jump on in. Okay, it's time to replace the NVRAM chip with the long dead battery. Now, it's, it is possible, and a couple people pointed out in the comments in the previous video, that it is possible to take one of these chips and basically chop it open and circumvent the battery that's inside of it and wire in a replacement battery. I, I'm too lazy for that, and this feels like a problem that money can solve. So I just purchased a replacement part on DigiKey. I'll provide a link to the exact part that I had ordered in the description of the video. Now, so the form factors are a little bit different. The, um, the original parts are in this weird kind of carrier thing. And if the new chip is installed in that, it doesn't fit right and has some issues. So this has to go out and then I'm just gonna it's all going to go. <laughs> uh, so this is pin one over here. Now, this is really difficult to get out. So it needs to be pried out with a lever of some sort. And something that I do when I need to pry things out of boards like this using a lever is I will use my finger as the, the fulcrum. And the reason that I do that is it is possible to damage boards by, by prying up against things. And I figure it's gonna hurt my finger enough that I will stop prying before I damage the board. And if I damage my finger, you know what? It'll, it'll heal, I'll, I'll be fine. So I'm just gonna put that under there and give that a little pry just until it gets going. And then come over and do this side. All right, that looks good enough. That Nope. Right. That might be enough. There. Easy peasy. Now, I am going to keep this with this system because, as I had mentioned before, the digits on here are the last three hex digits of the... Um, the last three bytes of the MAC address for the built-in Ethernet. You don't necessarily, there isn't a strong reason to keep the original MAC uh, address for these computers, but I mean, why not? <laughs> so the dot is pin one. So we could, and voila, NVRAM problem solved. The other thing I want to do while I have this open and, and out on the desktop is I want to install an optical drive in this so that I can actually install Solaris. For my previous research on the internet, I had been led to believe that finding a drive that would work to boot an OS disk on this computer would be challenging. I found that to not actually be the case. So the, the issue is for a drive to be for a CD-ROM drive to be bootable on one of these, it has to have five 12 byte blocks. Now most C optical drives, I'm assuming that DVD drives are the, are the same, have two kilobyte blocks. I found a list of drives that are known to work and a list of and and a list that are known to not work. Um, and so then I, I went searching through through my collection and I found a couple optical drives that I had in my collection. This is one of the first two that I, that I found. It's a you know 
For a CD-ROM drive, it's a pretty late model, March of 2000. Uh, it's a nice Plexter drive. And what this drive has on it is there is a jumper on the back here that is going to be really, really hard to read that says block. And that jumper selects the block size. And just to, to verify this, I found the manual for this drive, which I will also link in the description. And it says something very terse in the uh, in, in the manual. It says something like, only set this jump jumper if you want to boot this drive on a Unix machine. Like, okay, thanks. You could, like, don't describe the information to me. Give me the information. You are the source of information, damn it. <laughs> I hate it when documentation does that. Anyway, the other thing that is important to check on drives like this before installing them as the boot device, at least on a Spark Station, is the Spark Station expects the CD, the boot CD-ROM, the thing that the firmware will call CD-ROM, to be at SCSI ID six, and so it needs the drive needs to be jumpered for six. And so I had to look up in the documentation to make sure I had the right order of the um, of the bits for the SCSI ID. And it turns out the least significant bit is on the left. Could be either way. So that's so this is the ones, the twos, and the fours. So two plus four is six. So this is jumpered for SCSI ID six, and it has the block jumper set um, to set the smaller block size so this should be good to go this this should just work and before i get this installed so that is i this is way too short so i have an extension here because i was afraid this was going to be too short Now, I'm not intending to leave this drive in this case, uh, so I'm not gonna, going to actually mount it. However, if I can get this in here so that I can put the lid on, that will be tremendously helpful. So that's why I'm going through a bit of this. Now, they did not give very much length of cable on this that's frustrating so the question will be with the lid on can this drive actually open and close and I'm guessing that it won't so this this whole experiment may have been for naught. I don't <laughs> I don't understand what they were doing with this anyway I'm going to attempt to put the lid back on and then the next step will be to set all this stuff back up so that I can start trying to install Solaris. All right, so we're booted back up to the firmware prompt. And because it's a fresh uh, NVRAM chip, there's just garbage in the in the NVRAM. So I'm gonna just quickly go through uh, reprogramming the, the NVRAM. One thing that I forgot to mention in the previous video is one of the parts that gets programmed into the NVRAM is the machine type. And you can actually ask the machine what its machine type is to program it in. <laughs> There's a command real machine type. Okay. So there that will, when you use it in conjunction with another command, apparently I don't know all the, the magic. <laughs> it's, ENV real. No, okay, all right. So there's some other magic. Anyway, it'll work with the other with the MKP command. Um, you do real. Okay. And now I, so byte zero is set to one as the type of the firmware programming. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what this one signifies. 
The machine type is at byte offset one. This later when we print it, it should say 80, which is what I had you know manually selected before. Uh, and now it comes time to set the MAC address and I'm reading this off the old chip. And then the um, system ID. Oh, wait, no, that's right. So it was just these last three. And it automatically puts the system ID in ADMKPL. Control D, Control R, because that totally makes sense. Um, and then let's dump out and see what's in the data. So, yeah, it got 80, the proper MAC address proper machine serial number, it programs the checksum as part of what the MKPL command does, and then the rest of this will get filled in. So now there is a SCSI drive installed, so I should be able to do probe SCSI, and it will show the two hard drives and the SCSI CD-ROM, I hope. Ta-da! Yay, so that works. So. <laughs> now here's what's junky. This does not fit. Uh, you can see that it's way too tall and the case won't even pretend to close. So clearly Sun was selling some sort of smaller drives, but it, it will work for now. So now I should just be able to say boot CD-ROM and it will just boot off of the CD-ROM. Now, I am going to skip showing basically any of the OS installation process. It's my understanding from reading online uh, and from reading in the documentation for the install, for the Solaris install itself, that especially on this kind of machine with the slow hard drives that are in here, this process can take upwards of two hours. So I'm actually going to start this going. I, I I know from having read documentation that there's a couple interactive steps. I'm going to do those interactive steps. And then I'm going to leave. Because <laughs> I don't even want to sit and, and watch this or be in the same room with this loud thing any more than I absolutely have to. So we can see, yay, it's at least starting to boot. So everything is good as predicted. When I return, we should have a nice Solaris login window. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Let's hope, let's hope it turns out okay. And after waiting around for several hours, and by waiting around, I mean going out to a movie, <laughs> I now have a nice uh, login prompt. Now, there were a couple of other configuration bits that had to be done on this to get to the point where it's at all usable. Um, I've created a user account. Through the, the process of setting up this machine, I basically took all of the defaults, except I had to manually specify a home partition and a size for it. Otherwise, when it booted up, it had mounted an AutoFS, which I'm not really sure what that is, but it was read only and zero size. So I couldn't create any user accounts or or do anything. So I just kind of punted. I think that happened because the way that I set this up, um, and I'm gonna have to change it, so I'm gonna do another two hour reinstall. <laughs> Uh, I'm only using one of the one gigabyte disks, and that's just kind of scraping in at the minimum amount of fi of um, file space available for, for the install. So in the next video, there's going to be a bunch of frobbing around with that and a bunch of experiments, but I'm, I'm going to save that. The other thing I had to do was to configure some networking. Um... I installed the system without networking because at the time I didn't have the cable plugged in and I didn't want to mess around with it. Um, but afterwards, I needed to get some software on here 
and I didn't want to burn a bunch of CDs. And the other way that I was going to try to do it hasn't quite worked out yet. But that's also going to be in the next video, so I'm not gonna not gonna spill any of the beans. Uh, so I had to configure networking, which was actually pretty easy to get networking going using modern DHCP. I had to touch two files in um, in in Etsy. I had to touch DHCP.le0, which is the built-in Ethernet interface and hostname le0, and then reboot, and it just worked it was actually the easiest part of the whole deal um so now you know i've been struggling around with this for a while um and i have to answer the the age-old question about pretty well every kind of computer does it run doom and i'm very happy to say yes it does in a minute when it loads <laughs> And it actually runs pretty well in a window. I'm 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 pretty I'm pretty impressed with it, but I guess I shouldn't be because it's an 85 megahertz CPU. Like it's roughly the equivalent of a Pentium 90. It should be able to run Doom pretty pretty fast. Anyway, I'm gonna end the video here and uh, go off knee deep in the dead. That was a tremendous success. There were no major disasters. <laughs> I was able to find a CD-ROM drive that just worked with the system so that I could do an operating system install. And that operating system install went without any real major difficulties. It just took a long time. After it all got installed, I didn't have too much trouble config configuring the network. I had to, you know, do a bit of research and try to figure things out a little bit, but I got it working and I was able to get some pre-compiled software on it and play some games and actually have some fun. There were a few times in the process that happened off camera where I was kind of tempted to say to myself something like, this is a Unix system. I know this. But the reality was closer to, this is a really old Unix system. I don't remember any of this. <laughs> uh, you know, back in the late 90s, most Unix-like operating systems were pretty similar to each other, and they were kind of a hassle to work with, right? There was a reason that Unix never took off on the desktop. And since then, modern Unix-like operating systems have diverged quite a bit, and they are quite quite a bit easier to configure and set things up on. We'll see a bit more of that next time when I try to set up a zip drive on this system. It is way more irritating than a person would like for it to be. I'm going to build some additional software for some kind of quality of life improvements. And I'm going to test out a bunch of different disk configurations and do some, some benchmarking and answer some of the questions try to answer some of the questions raised in the comment section in the previous video about what the disk I.O. performance trade-offs are and what the noise trade-offs are. It's still super loud. The fans are super loud in it. The disks are horrifically loud in it. So I'm going to try to see where some of the trade-offs are and see if I can improve the performance because these disks are super slow and you know, improve the, the loudness of it a bit. But until next time, remember the good stuff. <laughs>